Hi folks, HR Funk here. A couple of weeks ago I produced a video on the top 10 most overrated handgun features and in the comments to that video I've had many of you mention that you think micro red dot sights on handguns are overrated. And there's been a couple of reasons that have been stated for that. Most prevalent have been that a lot of people believe that in a defensive encounter it will take place so quickly and at such a close distance that there's no way to even use iron sights, let alone use a micro red dot. And the other camp believes that there's really no advantage to the micro red dot sight, that simply iron sights are as accurate and as effective as the micro red dot, so there's no reason to go to the extra expense of having the micro red dot sight or even the mounting plates and other such accoutrements necessary to mount a micro red dot sight on your handgun. And this is one thing, there's a reason the micro red dot sights were not on that list. And I want to explore that a little bit in this video. Now I'm going to warn you, this video is going to be a lot of me just talking. And I'll try to edit in some footage of me on the range or something along the way just to make it a little bit more interesting. But I want to explore this and it's closely related to some things that I've talked about in some other previous videos that involve preconceptions of the type of a defensive encounter you might find yourself in. Now, as with many things in the defensive shooting world, the type of accessories you have on your firearm may or may not be beneficial in certain types of shooting situations. For example, you may be in a situation where any type of sighting device is completely useless because you are at such a close distance that there's really no necessity to use any type of sighting device. You can basically point your firearm right at the point <laughs> on the adversary where you want the bullet to go, and that's where it's going to go. But as distances increase, we could find a situation where sighting devices are necessary. And again, this is highly related to the type of preconceptions that we have when we think of defensive encounters. What tends to occur is people in their mind visualize what they really think is the most likely encounter they could find themselves in, and then they make their firearm selection and sighting selection and gear selection and everything else around that type of an encounter. Some people visualize a home defense situation, some people visualize an active threat incident at somewhere that they work, and some people have various other types of ideas for what type of defensive encounter they may find themselves in. And in some of those imaginary defensive encounters, there may be certain things that are going to be more beneficial, maybe a flashlight mounted to their firearm or what have you, in other types of defensive encounters that are imagined, those types of things might not be necessary. So when we start to preconceive the type of defensive encounter we might be in, we immediately start narrowing our choices or our options that we have available to us if we find ourselves in a defensive encounter that deviates from that preconception that we have. For example, if the only thing you are ever imagining is firing to defend yourself, and this 3-3-3 three, three, and three rule that I hear all the time, three shots in three seconds from three feet or whatever that nobody seems to be able to explain exactly where it came from, but in any regard, if that's the only thing you ever train for, and you find yourself in a situation where you are not defending yourself, but you are defending maybe a family member who is, say, 10 or 12 yards away from you and being attacked by, could be a person, could be a vicious animal, what have you, and you've never trained for any type of shooting beyond the three foot distance or five foot distance or whatever that rule says, a person who has done that could find themselves with shooting skills that are lacking to be able to take a proper defensive action, even though it's legally and morally justifiable. So again, we need to expand our thinking when it comes to training for defensive encounters to not only include what we expect to deal with, but maybe even some fringe or unexpected type issues. Now, we also could get into a situation where we try to come up with every possible imaginable contingency and we equip ourselves to deal with all of that. And that really becomes a, a situation where we are getting less <laughs> gains for our training uh, than probably we want to because some of those things are just so out there. You, yes, it's possible that a spaceship could land and we could have a horde of aliens that we have to defend ourselves from, but it's probably not going to happen. 
Now, as a former longtime law enforcement sniper, the idea of firing to defend someone else, and in my current role, the idea of firing to defend something else is a very real possibility. So I tend to train from greater distances, and I tend to consider other things like that along the way, more so than someone who is only thinking of defending themselves or home defense or something like that. And with the micro red dot sights, particularly, and I've mentioned this many times, as my eyes age, the front sight with iron sights, whether it's on a pistol or on a long gun, has become more and more fuzzy. Now I can still use them, and many times you'll see when I'm in my shooting videos, and particularly if I'm doing something like the tack shot or whatever, I have my reading glasses on, and the reason is because that sharpens that front sight to yes. the point that I can use it just about as well as I did when my eyes were younger. And a lot of you, if you're in your 20s or you're in your 30s and you're shooting iron sights and you think, I don't know why anyone would ever put a micro red dot on a firearm, they're not any faster than the iron sights. I can shoot just as well with the iron sights. Wait until you get to be about 50 or 55 or 60 and take a look at those sights. Now, maybe you'll be one of the fortunate few who still has very good vision at 55, 60 or whatever, and you still don't need a micro red dot. Or maybe you'll be like a lot of us who say, you know, it's awfully nice to have that glowing red dot out there. And I can see that perfectly with no reading glasses or no visual aids whatsoever. And I can still place my shots very well. So that's another consideration that some of the decisions you make regarding your equipment might depend on where you are in your life. I've had some people write in and comment that they still really like semi-automatic pistols but they don't use them anymore because they've gotten to the point where their hands are not strong enough to cycle the slides due to arthritis or just advanced age or what have you, so they've moved back to shooting revolvers. And again, those are decisions that people are going to make depending upon exactly where they are, what their physical condition is, and everything like that. So to illustrate my point about the problem with preconceptions, I'll tell a story involving myself, and this goes back a number of years shortly after the tragedy at the Columbine High School in Littleton, Colorado. And at that time, I was in charge of my police department SWAT team. And my chief came to me and he said that he wanted me to come up with a plan for our high school in case we would have an active threat incident there, which at that time was called an active shooting incident, and how we would respond to it both tactically and dealing with the aftermath and everything else. So I set out to come up with the perfect plan for dealing with that type of a situation at our high school. And I went out to the high school, I took measurements, I took photographs, I used a laser rangefinder to come up with distances, and I came up with an extremely comprehensive plan that involved everything from the initial patrol officer response to the SWAT team response, I had it mapped out where we would have media stage, where we were going to have reunification with parents and students take place, evacuation routes, ingress, egress. It was an extremely, extremely detailed plan. And when I got done, I was pretty proud of myself. And my chief was happy, people at the high school was happy, everybody felt safe, and everything was hunky-dory until sometime later I sat down and I started to look at that plan, and it occurred to me that if anything deviated from my preconception, which was very similar to the incident that had taken place at Columbine, that my whole plan was worthless. If, for example, the incident took place in the parking lot, all of a sudden all my routes and responses and where everyone was supposed to go and how they were supposed to set up and all that was out the window. If an incident took place on the football field or anything else, if there was any deviation whatsoever from what I had preconceived, this extremely comprehensive plan was useless. So what I started to do was dial everything back. I started to leave a lot more decision making up to the officers as they were responding to the supervisors who were on the scene so they would have the flexibility to be able to adapt the plan that was created to the situation that was actually taking place. And I've seen that type of extremely detailed planning based on preconceptions in a lot of law enforcement policies. And I see it in the thinking of a lot of people when they are looking at dealing with defensive situations. Again, start to <laughs> broaden your mind a little bit, start to expand your thinking. Think about all of those potential contingencies that are outside of your preconception 
and all of a sudden you might start to see things like micro red dot sites might have their place in the right type of circumstances or they might have their place for certain types of people again depending upon their vision their age etc and that's the video for today i hope you enjoyed it if you have any questions or comments as always make sure you forward those to me remember if you purchase anything from optics planet be sure to use my discount code which is and if you use that discount code it's good for five percent off anything you purchase from optics planet also remember, warbirdbunker.com is making t-shirts for the channel. If you go to warbirdbunker.com, you can find my t-shirts there, my stickers with the little tack in the middle and all that. And you can also find all of Nathan's other patriotic and firearm themed gear. If you use my discount code at warbirdbunker.com, which is HR Funk for you, that'll save you 10% off your entire order from warbirdbunker.com. See you next time, folks. Until then, good shooting. Bye-bye.